So first, evangelization. Evangelization is not a word that I grew up with. So we had home and foreign missionaries, and we had evangelical councils, but no evangelization. In 1967, I was a senior in college, and a group of scholars, distinguished scholars at Catholic University, produced the first edition of the new Catholic Encyclopedia. And you will comb the pages of the new Catholic Encyclopedia in vain for a, a reference for, a, for an article on evangelization. There isn't one. So the, the new Catholic Encyclopedia was produced in a relatively thick and confident subculture. And though they were getting restless, the grandchildren of immigrants were still populating seminaries and convents and rectories. So less than a decade later, during a memorable time of confusion and turmoil in the church, Pope Paul VI introduced evangelization into, the mainstream, into mainstream Catholic discourse with Evangelii Nunciandi. Before long, Pope John Paul II introduced the new evangelization that appears in the title of our conference. This, this phrase tends to make university people very uncomfortable. My teachers believe they had bequeathed to us real universities in the full modern sense of the word with a strong commitment to and concern for academic excellence. That's from the Land O'Lakes Statement of 1967 which some of you look possibly old enough to remember. <laughs> Do we in US Catholic higher education really want to get mixed up with something called the new evangelization? What is this new evangelization anyway? If you've ever wondered, read Evangelii Nunciandi. It's stunning. Still timely and provocative, it claims that the church exists to preach the gospel and identifies Jesus Christ and salvation in him as the gospel. It's pretty simple, right? But its expansive sense of evangelization is not limited to preaching, either from pulpits or from street corners. It's primarily about witness. The church's main job is to show people what Jesus Christ and salvation in him look like. Pretty simple. In the church, Paul VI wrote, the witness given by a truly Christian life must be regarded as the basic means of evangelization. There you go. He continued, and Cardinal Worrell quoted this last night. This is like the theme of this talk. People listen more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. Or if they listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. Evangelii Nunciandi's concluding plea for authentic witness sounds like something Pope Francis wrote. His own Evangelii Gaudium in 2013 deliberately recalls Evangelii Nunciandi by its title and style and cites it 13 times, more than it cites any other document. Despite all this, I had little idea in 2013 of the depth of Pope Francis's affinity for Paul VI's 40-year-old apostolic exhortation. From Austin Ivory's biography of Pope Francis, I learned that Evangelii Nunciandi has strong Argentine roots in something called the theology of the people with its joining of liberation theology, liberation theology's preferential option for the poor, and a deep appreciation for popular religion. Ivore says that Evangelii Nunciandi was Bergoglio's favorite church document, the one he would cite throughout his time as provincial, rector, and later bishop. He saw it as reconciling church teaching with the diversity of cultures. Francis calls Evangelii Nunciandi, to my mind, the greatest pastoral document that has ever been written to this day. The greatest pastoral document 
that has ever been written to this day. You should read it if you never have. Shortly after his election, Pope Francis described the new evangelization in terms of his signature themes of mercy and encounter. Because of profound contemporary needs, he said, the new evangelization cannot but use the language of mercy, made up of gestures and attitudes, even before words. The church, he continued, needs to go out to encounter others. In what follows, I propose to you something that something like the, the new evangelization is the most powerful way to promote the mission of our Catholic institutions of higher education on a political and religious landscape of pluralism and volunteerism, absent a strong Catholic culture. Personal witness is indispensable in convincing both colleagues and students of the worth of such idiosyncratic intellectual goods as the following. The search for an integration of knowledge, a dialogue between faith and reason, an ethical concern, and a theological perspective. These are the four characteristics of research at a Catholic university from ex coria ecclesiae. They're not like self-evident to university people. In education, as in many other areas of life, just about everything is personal. A recent study of the relationship between the college experience and college graduates' lives after college identified what it called the big six experiences and linked them to life preparedness. Three support experiences and three experiential learning experiences make up the big six. The three support experiences underline the importance of what in evangelical language we might call faculty witness. By far the most significant of the big six is this one. I had at least one professor who made me excited about learning. 63% of the people who were successful after college by, you know, various self-identified measures said yes to that question. It's by far the, high, the highest one of the big six. John Henry Newman didn't need a Gallup-Purdue index to tell him the importance of what he called the living voice to the idea of a university, which he defined briefly and popularly as a place for the communication and circulation of thought by means of personal intercourse. As we look back on the history of Catholic education over the past 50 years, the present urgency for Catholic identity of the personal, intentional, and indeed the evangelical becomes clear. During that period, two factors central to curriculum became deeply problematized. First, the makeup of the faculty, and second, the very idea of curricular course content itself. So the second part, Catholic identity and the Catholic intellectual tradition emerge. We live and work in institutions that make up part of the remains of a once vibrant but relatively isolated immigrant Catholic subculture. My grandmother was born in Genoa. I didn't call it a ghetto, nor did I say that we live in its ruins, which is a you know, common way to describe our present situation. My story is not a declension narrative, but an engaged historical and sociological look at the schools that have been my academic home and more for over half a century. I have no desire to turn back the clock and teach on a homogeneously Catholic faculty intellectually unified by something like modern neo-scholasticism. So that's just a caveat. By the end of World War II, this subculture had close to 300, 300 colleges and universities. At the end of the 1960s, however, simultaneous with post humane vitae implementation of Vatican II, and with that period of collective effervescence known as the 60s, something striking happened. Even without the council, 
we would have seen something very close to this demographic phenomenon. In terms of such measures as levels of education and income, Catholics became statistically indistinguishable from other Americans. We had been assimilated into mainstream America, in large part through the work of Catholic higher education. The immigrant Catholic subculture had collapsed, or better, it dissolved, absorbed into its surroundings. Catholic institutions, however, remained. Here we are. In too many cases, however, administrators realized too late that without the subculture, their institutions were now intentional, voluntary choices in a pluralistic mix. Catholic students could now go to college wherever they could get in and pay. My elders seemed to believe that there would always be Catholics. There were always Catholics in the subculture. Leaders in higher education assumed that Catholic elementary and high schools would keep sending students. Catholic colleges would continue to send faculty. It took a long time for people to start asking where the next generation of Catholics would come from and who would teach them how to be Catholics. The most deeply formed Catholics I knew were the religious sisters and priests who taught me through college. Pope Francis has spoken of the lost generation of Jesuits that occasioned his appointment as provincial in 1973. During this iconoclastic period between 1968 and 1980, so many members of the founding religious communities left that Catholic institutions had to replace them with lay faculty. And this seemed quite in keeping with Vatican II's vision of an apostolic laity. At present, hiring practices at most Catholic schools have become intentional about mission, what's called mission. This is a new, a new word. In many cases, however, decades of haphazardly hiring the best people, judged solely in terms of disciplinary specialization and without regard to what is now called mission, have taken a heavy toll in the area of the university related most closely to curriculum, the faculty. By, 1970s, by the 1970s, what Catholic meant was no longer clear. Even institutions now intentional about hiring found themselves by 1980 with significant numbers of tenured faculty who did their jobs conscientiously, but for whom the, f the fact that the university was Catholic was a matter of indifference, genuine confusion, or even hostility. When they could no longer take it for granted, people began to talk about Catholic identity. No one agonized over Catholic identity in 1950. It was just there. They realized that they had to hire for mission and have mission officers. In the 1950s, such talk would have been sociological nonsense. Before long, Catholics of a certain age began to realize that the intellectual world they lived in and in which they had been formed could no longer be taken for granted. And so they gave it a name. And that's how we got the Catholic intellectual tradition. I've, I've been trying to figure out where that term came from. The closest I can come is that Andrew Greeley invented it in the 60s. Contemporary people inhabit many worlds at once. Catholic is more a world than a brand. Dr. Wu called it a home. More than simply a set of idiosyncratic beliefs that I hold, it's a history and a geography that I inhabit in the communion of saints. Much more than spiritual, it resists confinement to the interior, and it reaches out for culture. It strains in the direction of culture. Intellectually, it is a tradition of inquiry. It's the history of what happens when people who inhabit this world think in a variety of disciplined ways when they make art and do research. This is a history of diverse intellectual productions, not only in philosophy and theology, but also in Christian humanism, broadly conceived to include arts, sciences, and professions. I want to say something about the Catholic intellectual tradition. 
which is where I live, but which is a great mystery to many of my colleagues. Sometimes I want to give them like a 40-page bibliography divided by centuries and say, you want to know what this is, just read it. But I can't really do that. I have to encounter them. <laughs> anyway, so, so here we go. The biblical doctrines of creation and incarnation make CIT possible. They ground its presumption that knowledge and truth are one. Copernicus and Gregor Mendel thought that they were studying God's creation. The best English language, language account of this tradition is Newman's idea of a university. Newman's distinction between the notional, that is, impersonal and abstract, and the real, that is, personal and affective apprehension and assent, helped to explain how the unity of knowledge might work. Newman speaks, for example, of the need for real apprehensions from history and poetry to adorn the notional abstractions of philosophy and theology. But contemporary academic specialization militates against achieving the university as conversation among disciplines of which Newman dreamed. This is the problem of administrators. I don't have to worry about this. CIT's style and sensibility signified by such words as analogy, incarnation, and sacrament, I wanted to say to Dr. Wu, welcome to my world, sacrament with a big S and a small s. But anyway, that's one of the, that's one of the words that signifies this sensibility. Depend intimately on the opening chapters of Genesis and the commentary on them in the word made flesh of St. John's prologue. They convey a deep Catholic expectation that in the divine economy revealed in creation and incarnation, when we turn our attention to the people and things of God's creation, that we, they will show us God's presence. If this sounds like finding God in all things, it should come as no surprise. St. Ignatius is an early modern classic of CIT. With their appeal to the imagination and the religious affections, the spiritual exercises embody what Newman meant by real apprehension and assent. Teachers have to have real apprehension, otherwise they got nothing. Finding God in all things, however, is not easy. Christian humanism involves a deep tension. Despite his strong expectation that all created things can lead us to God, the end for which we were made, St. Ignatius is quite conscious that created things can also lead us away from God. He therefore counsels careful discernment in the Holy Spirit. Throughout the spiritual exercises, the mysteries of Jesus' life guide us in finding God in all things. And Jesus, of course, is led to the cross. And so together with the incarnation and the sacrament of John's prologue, we also need the self-emptying, the cross, and exaltation of the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2, the Christ who became obedient unto death. In Newman's terms, we can speak notionally of searching for God in all things. But the experience of searching and finding is really expressed through things like biography and history. The deep tension in Christian humanism is most beautifully rendered in the art and literature of CIT. If you want to understand its deep sensibility, read Flannery O'Connor's story, Revelation, or The Power and the Glory by Graham Greene. From St. Augustine's Confessions to Dante and on to the novels of Alice McDermott or the memoirs of Richard Rodriguez, not to mention visual and musical arts, and of course, Bruce Springsteen, we find this Johannine sacramental sense of creation laced with the cross and exaltation of Philippians 2. This is brought home with scholarly rigor in cultural studies such as American Catholic Arts and Fictions by Paul Giles, Material Christianity by Colleen McDaniel, and Stephen Schlesser's Jazz Age Catholicism. Next to my desk hangs a very large print of Quentin Metzis's 1517 portrait of Erasmus. Erasmus is my hero. 
It reminds me daily that CIT is above all a Christ-inflected form of humanism. But like the historical afterglow of Erasmus, it is sometimes fragile, elusive, and often ambivalent. You have to remember that I lived through the iconoclastic period from 1968 to 1980. That's my studied theology. The fact that I stand before you is solely due to God's grace. I, I, not too many people survived that. You survived. <laughs> anyway, curriculum. Okay, along with peer review for hiring, tenure, and promotion, curriculum is the faculty's primary responsibility in most systems of shared governance. This makes their views on Catholic identity and the Catholic intellectual tradition crucial for curriculum's relation to mission. With what has been said so far as background, I shall talk about curriculum from the perspective of who the faculty are and more briefly from the perspective of who students are. For all faculty, curriculum involves the nuts and bolts of what they do every day. They tend to feel pretty strongly about curriculum. Curriculum is a zero-sum game with only so many courses or credits to go around. Turf battles among programs and departments are not unusual. Most Catholic colleges and universities have some form of general education. It usually includes philosophy, theology, and other disciplines deemed necessary for liberal education, such as the sciences, literature, and history. Although mission, along with the local market needs, plays into development of a school's distinctive programs overall, general education is usually where mission-related discussions generate the most heat. Humanities departments, such as philosophy the and theology and increasingly history and literature, find themselves with relatively few majors. Faculty members spend most of their time teaching required core courses rather than majors. In such service departments, faculty members are typically concerned to ensure that general education includes some of their program's courses. While all faculty members should be concerned about content in general education, faculty and service departments, especially if they consider themselves keepers of mission, have a keen interest, shall I say, in core course content. Faculty members in departments and programs with large majors, by contrast, generally spend most of their time teaching their majors. Faculty in pre-professional schools and programs generally focus on courses in those programs and on ways to find additional curricular space for their students. You can see this shaping up here. The two groups have different self-interests. With regard to general education, service departments tend to worry more about its content. Heavily enrolled programs in schools tend to worry more about how big the general education program is and how much curricular space it takes up. It's all about curricular space. It falls to provosts and deans to inspire, cajole, incentivize, and otherwise motivate faculty to revise and reform curriculum. And this is the great dream to somehow unite in common purpose the humanities and the professions to serve the mission. General education curriculum revision is perhaps the most demanding challenge that a faculty member will ever face. When faculty discuss general education reform, the lines of debate are predictable. They usually fall between the pre-professional programs aligned with other large majors, looking for curricular space in the name of market needs, and the service departments looking to preserve or expand their offerings in the name of mission. In neither of these two appeals can self-interest and cynicism be entirely ruled out. It falls to administrators, therefore, with their oversight of the whole to balance mission needs with timely responsiveness to market needs. In addition, this is my favorite part, we have the recent corporatization of higher education. 
students as customers and curriculum as product does not bode well for humanistic education. Unique in the world as voluntary institutions are more than 200 Catholic colleges and universities survive with limited indirect state support. Along with the rest of higher education, however, they face rising costs, dramatic demographic change, and skepticism about whether their product is worth what it costs. From parents and students to private donors and board members, stakeholders increasingly demand greater financial accountability. Strategies and metrics, not to mention leaders imported from the corporate world, tend to foster concern for better short-term alignment with the needs of the economy and deep suspicion of time-honored university institutions such as academic freedom and tenure. They really hate tenure. I lost my place here. The object of deepest suspicion, however, even worse than tenure, is this weird thing that only universities have and corporations don't have, known as shared governance. They really don't get shared governance. And under shared governance falls the faculty's responsibility for curriculum. All this can appear to faculty members as short-sighted and out of touch with the long-term humanistic purposes of a Catholic university. That's how they appear to me. A growing corporate atmosphere puts increasing pressure on departments and faculty members to justify their places in the curriculum on the basis of the needs of the economy and elaborate metric-based outcomes assessments. We have dashboards with green lights and red lights. I just love them. To the extent that corporatization enhances fiscal responsibility and institutional stability, you know, we all want to be in stable institutions. It is to be applauded. To the extent that it detracts from mission by weakening those aspects of curriculum most closely connected to the Catholic intellectual tradition, it is to be deplored and rejected and resisted. Growing the brand is not enough. Without deep and respectful dialogue and encounter, to use Pope Francis's favorite words, when corporate culture meets academic culture, disaster will strike, as happened recently at Mount St. Mary's in nearby Maryland, where I spent the last year on sabbatical, so I was there for all of this. Catholic doesn't sell, the faculty was told by a venture capitalist turned university president. Liberal arts doesn't sell. Two scenarios and their variations are the likely result of general education revision. And neither is usually found in its pure form. Why don't you just make a list of courses and let the students choose? That's what the interim provost asked the faculty at Mount St. Mary's. And this represents the first scenario or distribution model of core of general education. Distribution requirements are not bad. They help to restore minimal order to higher education after the post-1968 cultural unrest threw into question the very idea of grades and requirements. I was there for that. Distribution core accomplish a lot in the areas of skills and competencies and in the life of the mind and imagination considered formally, that is, an abstraction from any content. Focus on such goals and student learning outcomes as quantitative writing and technological skills and competencies, critical thinking and transfer of knowledge help students achieve the kind of intellectual agility that make college graduates assets in businesses and as citizens. Liberal arts education really can free minds and imaginations to distance themselves from present confines, including those of their own status and position, and see beyond the present. Students learn to ask, what if, what else? Distribution cores expose students to diverse areas of knowledge. 
They encourage a critical perspective that requires students to learn more than just one subject well. Exactly what they learn well doesn't matter so much. Distribution cores tend to be entrepreneurial. The faculty develop courses that I sometimes describe as free market sex. Poor performing professors get fewer students. If I taught in a state university or a non-church related private school, I'd strongly advocate for a distribution core of at least 30 to 36 credits. But alas, a Catholic university cannot be satisfied with a distribution core because it is committed to helping students learn what it is like to inhabit this weird thing called the Catholic intellectual tradition. The Catholic intellectual tradition is historically and culturally located in the West. For a core curriculum in a US Catholic university, therefore, content matters. One alternative to distribution might be a content-heavy modification. But this limits student choice in ways that work against the very notion of distribution and move in the direction of greater structure. So the second alternative is a content-driven core with variations on chronological or thematic structure and sequence and conceived against an ideal horizon of integration. In the introduction, Luke mentioned that I worked on making a core like that. They just blew it up. This is like, it doesn't you know, encourage you to, to like, anyway. It's very sad. Um, this might spell curricular ruin, such a curriculum. For those who think of the Western tradition as no more than a set of ethnic habits. But a structural basis in the Western homes of the Catholic intellectual tradition doesn't preclude other core components such as global encounters, intercultural and interreligious dialogue, or world Christianity. One sees other cultural and religious traditions through the lenses of one's own. Without critical appropriation of those lenses, one risks seeing others through the hopelessly distorted lenses of tourism and exoticism. Such a structured, integrated, and more content-driven core curriculum would be less entrepreneurial than a pure distribution model. So imagine the faculty gathered to consider general education. They're faced with these prospects. Their desire to spend their days teaching what they know is likely to trump their dreams for a distinctive general education program. They, they occasionally have dreams for such things outside their discipline. What if a majority find the phrase Catholic intellectual tradition bewildering? What if they cannot imagine what Catholic could possibly have to do with literature or history or sociology as autonomous disciplines, not to mention with biology or physics? What if the Catholic intellectuals in the room are few in number, inarticulate, and lack the interpersonal skills to practice politics? What if they fail to command the respect of their peers as scholars and teachers? What happens to the intellectual dimension of Catholic then? One common answer only reinforce, reinforces cultural assumptions about religion as personal beliefs, dogmas, and rules by shifting responsibility for the intellectual dimension of Catholic to the theology department, or sometimes to the philosophy and theology department, depending how badly they've hired in philosophy, together. In another scenario, a minority of Catholic intellectuals, perhaps with help from the founding community, sets up programmatic Catholic curricular enclaves along the lines of the cohort model described by Mori and Pitteris. However robustly Catholic such reservations may be, they fail to reach a majority of students. But sometimes they're the best that we can do with what we got. The conclusion is simple. A university can only have the kind of curriculum or general education program that the faculty it has hired, tenured, and developed is capable of designing 
and wants to teach. If a university hasn't hired what back in the days of ex corde we used to call a critical mass. Remember critical mass. We have lots of a critical mass of faculty members who are either A, articulate Catholic intellectuals, B, otherwise seriously engaged religious scholars, or C, just ordinary folks who are open to the possibility that religious traditions are humanly important and worth talking about, then that university is, let's just say, they're up the creek. Without teachers who are also witnesses, scholars who have achieved excellence in the practice of dialogue and encounter, then no matter what administrators and mission officers say, that university can't build a curriculum that can hand on the Catholic intellectual tradition. Students will not be able to learn there what it might be like to dwell in that tradition. My insistence on hiring for mission is not meant to imply that administrators should ordinarily, ordinarily is the great word of all you know, procedures, and should not ordinarily be directly involved, directly, life is about adverbs, involved in hiring. Nevertheless, they can be indirectly involved in various ways from making available development opportunities on hiring for mission, participating in interview processes, and variously incentivizing in creative ways the recruitment and hiring of mission-friendly faculty. In any case, hiring is too important to be left solely in the hands of departments or divisions whose concerns are primarily and rightly disciplinary. That's what they get hired for rather than for the good of the whole. That's a lot about faculty and curriculum. What about the students? It is often said that students can't learn the Catholic intellectual tradition because increasingly they aren't Catholics. Those who are Catholics have barely a loose cultural connection to the faith. Most frequently cited is the rise of the nuns, the deep distrust of institutional religion, and the trend toward disaffiliation among the college age population. I read the contemporary religious landscape differently. I see instead a certain providential epistemological leveling. Students tend to know more about, know no more about Catholicism than they know about Islam. The fluidity of contemporary pluralism strongly suggests that Christian denominational differences make little sense to our students. Try to teach the Reformation. If they distrust religious institutions, however, they remain intrigued by the values of Christianity and all religions. They kind of tend to think that all religions have the same values, and, and they're interested in them. Teaching and learning about Catholicism, especially in its real rather than notional aspects, is often the epistemological equivalent of teaching and learning about Hinduism. When students are not turn, turned off by judgmental and too political religions, religious institutions, religion in most of its lived forms retains a powerful allure, lives of saints, holy people, Pope Francis. On such a level landscape, knowledgeable and passionate teachers are going to turn students on to something. That's what they do. One teacher who made me excited about learning, the first among the big six experiences. So Catholic universities should have an abundance professors who can turn students on to the Catholic intellectual tradition. What a concept. OK, I'm almost done. For Pope Francis, the new evangelization means dialogue and encounter. If we have learned anything from this pope over the past three years, it is the centrality of the personal. People love this guy. People are attracted to the gospel by the beauty of those who live it. To combine, to combine Francis and Newman, dogma or the notional is in the service of the pastoral or the real. Dialogue and encounter can be notional philosophical words. Francis adorns them with language that appeals to the imagination and the affections. 
He calls us to go forth, repeated over and over again. Go forth from our comfort zones. Go forth from the church. Guided by the narrative sense of Jesus in the Gospels, take off your shoes in the presence of others. Smell them. Walk with them, even to the extent of getting mud on your shoes. This is what encounter and accompaniment mean. Dogma in the service of the pastoral, Sabbath in the service of people. As universities shift to market speak about building the brand, customers and products, metrics and dashboards, Newman's living voice remains central to what students learn in our universities. Education, like evangelization, is personal. The heart, Newman claims, is commonly reached not through the reason, but through the imagination. Persons influence us, he says. Voices melt us. Looks subdue us. Deeds inflame us. Professors strive to be rational. But what if they concentrated in a compensatory way on the personal? Suppose they tried to practice encounter and dialogue to accompany each other in the way that Pope Francis describes. What if they used their own intellectual agility and cultural understanding as educated people to enter sympathetically rather than agonistically into each other's worlds, the lived frames, in terms of which things appear rational or not? On a number of campuses, the 2015 encyclical Laudato Si has offered an occasion to begin such interdisciplinary dialogue and encounter. Everybody can get on board with Laudato Si, at least in universities. But what does this have to do with evangelization? Isn't it just education? No! There really is something here. The term new evangelization names a momentous shift from Catholic as cultural inheritance to Catholic as voluntary and inclusive. Pope Francis has freed this term from associations with US culture wars that it may possibly have acquired in recent decades. And he offers a new frame in which to reimagine the church and its educational mission, not as culturally given, but a frame in which neither the church nor its schools can live without the encounter and dialogue of personal witness. By analogy, it names the only way we can achieve collective goals when pluralism is normed by diversity instead of by consensus. This idea that education is about personal witness, I think that all of the founders of Catholic schools would be all over this, like Abbot Boniface would get this, Mother Seton would get it, Catherine Drexel would get it, Father Chaminade would get it, they'd all get it. It's just, it's what we gotta do. Thank you.